Okay, can you guys hear me well? This is great to be part of this. It was, it was wonderful to hear Fred talk and show all these phenomenal structures. These things used to be little cartoons, not, um, not actual molecular structures. And uh, so what I'm going to do is, like Fred, I'm not going to speak about any work that we've done in my own laboratory, but I'm going to try to get a bit of, just a little bit of background to give you a flavor for the kind of voltage scales that occur in, in, in neuroscience and a little bit of uh, the flavor of how neurons uh, actually do computing. Um, I think, as, as Fred described, nature invented this sort of amazing uh, machine, a conductance that is uh, select the key to maintain voltage level, ability to switch in, uh, in really a kind of digital logic. And, um, and then also uh, nature invented uh, channels that are sensitive to voltage or sensitive to ligand binding. In either case, a change in free energy, which will actually change the conductance. And this allows um, switching events, and as I'll describe a little bit later, allows nature to build uh, diodes, which are basically um, responsible for synaptic transmission. Okay, so um, is there a way to, let's see, switch to this display? You're watching me. Can you switch to the display? Yeah. All right. You don't need to see me. Uh, I can show you a picture of my daughter and my dog at the end. They're much better looking. But, uh, okay, first, it's actually worth understanding what a neuron is. So tell me how, how good this picture is. Uh, you know, Fred uh, sort of did a super spherical cow kind of picture. I just want to make it a little bit uh, fancier. There's a part of a cell that, uh, I don't mean this to look like a hand. Now keep in mind that everything in biology has an exception, so we'll just don't worry about it. There's a part of the cell that receives input uh, from neighbors. Uh, okay, the pen's a little slow, good. There's, um, Part of the cell that Fred talked about, he talked about the sodium channels that is capable of uh, producing a, a pulse. But uh, the point is not just the pulse, it's also uh, capable of, of what I would call threshold logic. Okay, and um, there's, you know, both within this uh, region, which is called dendrites, which is where inputs are coming. And within the soma, this is the region of uh, synaptic integration. Okay, somehow there's a very long delay between I write and the pen. And this is called, this is the output. This is called the axon. And this is a little cartoon. And then the question um, is how big is this? And let me just answer this question. This would be anywhere from uh, something like 0 0.1 to uh, 1 millimeter. Okay, this looks pretty clear. Okay, so this is a, a really brutalized cartoon, but let me see if I can show you a picture that reflects a little more reality here. So uh, everybody can see this picture. So sort of a mutual colleague of ours, uh, Bobby Kasiri, uh, working in Jeff Wickland's lab as a postdoc at Harvard, spent many years reconstructing uh, what is, oops, oh my God, come back, come back, come back. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I could draw on this thing without uh, messing this up. We'll try. Okay. This is going to be about 50 micrometers, and I'll get this back. There we go. Okay, so he, he spent a, a big chunk of his life actually uh, reconstructing a very small piece. This is a little piece of the dendrite, okay? And this is the, the, the sense I want to get to you. The, the way in which you have to view the nervous system are not neurons in isolation, which is the, the sort of sense you get 
offering from textbook, but they are jam-packed. And uh, Bobby did this reconstruction. I'm not going to go into the technology. Um, what's shown here in red is a piece of the, of the dendrite. And uh, what's shown here are dendrites from neighboring cells and axons from neighboring cells. And let's just see how this goes. So I'm, I'm rotating it. Okay. Okay, now it's, it's all flying apart. Now, the, the point of this is all these individual structures are glommed together, and some of the axons from neighboring cells will actually uh, form what's called a synapse. I'm just going to come back here. And this is a connection. And without going into the details at the moment, this connection is, is called a synapse. Uh, and I think the point that you should think about this is really acts as a diode. Current flows in uh, one direction. Okay. Oops, now we have a problem. Okay, one second. My pen became enormous. This is my first time I've ever given a, I've used a tablet for Okay, it's still enormous. Okay, give, it, give me another second here, please. All right, so this raises a couple of questions. On the one hand, you have this very high density. You say fine. It's just sort of the way my graduate students build electronics. They wire things up, they solder them together, and then they squish them and smash them and, and stick them in a box. But the, one of the important points here is that what's now shown is all this tremendous amount of space between the components in fact, has to be maintained in the adult. So there's extracellular space that acts as a, uh, effectively a ground plane between uh, neighboring synapses, uh, neighboring uh, dendrites. And when that space gets too small, as it happens in people when they become dehydrated, you start to get capacitive coupling between different cells. So this, so this, this is the last time I'll mention the extracellular space, but you really have to think of this in the flavor of an integrated circuit. Um, in which many components are pressed together, but except for communicating through dendrites, um, this um, space is, uh, is, very, is, uh, uh, is the only way in which cells will communicate. Otherwise, the cells are very well isolated from each other. Okay, so that's a bit of a, of a picture of a cell. And now, the thing I'd like to talk about is, oops, huh, stop that is the idea of the, of the voltage levels within a cell. So let's talk about the voltage levels and the signaling levels. Huh. Okay, so uh, the little pen is having emotional problems, but maybe we could just deal with it. Okay, in digital electronics, modern electronics, we think of very large switching voltage. So in electronics, we may have voltages that are like on the order of two to uh, three volts. These are huge. In neurobiology, all the voltage levels are set by this particular scale, which is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, that's an energy, divided by the electronic charge. So these are, uh, this is in volts, okay? So energy is in electronic volts divided by E in volts. And at room temperature, this is 25 millivolts. All right. So this is the scale. And I want to explain to you where the scale comes from. Um, so let's think of a cell. So one thing that uh, Fred explained, he explained about the fact that there are pumps and there are ions that are selectively permeable. Uh, there are channels that are selectively permeable the different ions. So nature basically made use of salt water, and cells have a high sodium concentration on the outside and a relatively low sodium concentration on the inside. And this is maintained by a pump. Now the flip side is that nature keeps a rather high potassium concentration on the inside and a relatively low potassium concentration on the outside. 
And this too is maintained by a pump, the pump moving in the opposite direction. Now, you couldn't have guessed this, but it turns out that this is the same pump. This is called the sodium potassium exchanger. Uh, okay, sodium goes in, potassium comes out, it burns energy, it burns ATP, and it maintains these gradients. So now what's the consequence of maintaining a gradient of ion? Okay, so we're gonna have, the idea is basically this. Let's just look at uh, sodium for the moment. Let's just look at a little piece of membrane here. And I'm going to put in one of these channels that uh, Fred described. And this channel is only going to be permeable to sodium. Okay. So now suppose you have sodium ions in the middle here. And we have counter charges around the sodium. Okay. So... The concentration is, let's say, high. Let's just call this the outside. Okay, if I, it looks kind of funny with the curvature this way, so we'll, I'll just cheat, change it. Okay. Now I have an ion channel. There's a gradient now. So if there's a gradient, there's a chemical potential. Okay, so what happens to one of the sodium ions? Well, the sodium ion wants to move this way. It wants to go through the channel, and it wants to end up on the other side. So what it, what's happening now is that there's a, chemical, there's a chemical potential that wants to push the ion to one side. On the other hand now, I've built up an electric field. So the chemical potential is balanced by the electric field. So Fred just mentioned very briefly this thing called the Nernst potential, but let's just understand this for a second very, very carefully. So what I want to do is I want to balance what's called the chemical potential against the voltage that's building up. I want to, get, I want to balance this against the voltage across the membrane. Okay, so let me... Um, Use the magic here. I'm just going to move up a little bit. So just as a reminder of a little bit of physics, the, the chemical potential just asks, how does the free energy change when I move one particle? Now, this is just an important thing to remember. The entire reason you're going to get a chemical potential that's dependent on moving a particle, which in, in a sense is the entire way you could build up an, an electrical potential in biology has to do with identical particles. So I'm just going to sketch this a second. A free energy goes like the Boltzmann energy, and it goes like the log of this object called the partition function. And so you don't have to worry about what the partition function is. The point is this. All sodium at atoms are identical. So this looks like a description of a single particle um, partition function, and there's n of them if I have n particles around. And then if I have n sodium particles, I could just move them around. I could, I could decide to take one, and I have one of n positions, and I could take another one and place it somewhere, and I have one of n minus one positions. So I have n factorial ways of arranging this thing. So... The point then is that the uh, this guy then oops, looks like minus KBT times N times the natural log of this single partition function. And when I take the derivative with respect to N, this just gives me a constant. And then it's going to give me another place piece that looks like KBT times uh, the log of N factorial. N factorial we know looks something like n to the n from Stirling's law plus other factors. So this thing at the end of the day looks like kBT times n log n plus 
plus um, something which is order n. And therefore, if I could move down, let me try this. Fantastic. Okay. This uh, chemical potential is going to look something like minus T BT, sorry, the sign times something that looks like log N plus constant. All right, so the point is that the chemical potential looks like a log of a number or the log of a concentration. So I'm going to take these two things. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to the top of the blackboard. I'm just going to, you know what, I have an idea. Hold on for a second. I know what to do. I am going to go image, canvas size, and just make this a lot bigger. Okay? Okay, there we go. We got space. So when I equate these, I'm going to get something like looks like this. That EV looks like K Boltzmann T times the log of, I'm sort of jumping a couple of steps, but it's the concentration of sodium on the outside. over the concentration on the inside. And I could just move the E and we get back to 25 millivolts I described. So this is known as the Nernst equation. And conceptually it's very important because it tells you that a concentration gradient will turn into a voltage. And this is the voltage that neurons are gonna be used for signaling. It also tells you that I mean, if you change the, if you double the concentration, the voltage generally changes. If the concentration goes up by an order of magnitude, the difference goes up by an order of magnitude, then maybe you're changing the voltage by a factor of two or three. So this is truly the scale for voltages. And we can start to make a little plot. So I did one, and if we remember from back here, Right, sodium is big on the outside, small on the inside, and potassium is big on the inside, small on the outside. So therefore, whatever the potentials are, the potential for sodium and potassium have to come in with different signs. So as a, as a matter of, sorry. Yeah, this thing is very fidgety and I paid a lot of money for it. It's a little crazy, okay. So there's a reversal potential due to sodium, which is going to sit here. This just turns out to have a number that looks like around minus, um, sorry, around plus 75 millivolts, about 3 kT. And there's another reversal here due to potassium. And this turns out to have a number that's about 90, minus 90 millivolts. That's minus around, um, three and a half, four kT. Okay, zero has absolutely no meaning in this case, all right? Zero has no meaning. The way the cell works is this. There's gonna be a threshold voltage, which I'm gonna describe in a moment. This is gonna come in at around minus 40 millivolts or so. Everywhere in this region, which is about minus 50 millivolts, you have about two kT over E to uh, integrate input from neighbors. Then there's going to be a threshold where the cell says, aha, voltages come in, and I haven't talked about how that occurs yet, but it's going to be input. Oh. I'm sorry for this jumpiness. It's going to be inputs that are coming in from many dendrites. So this is an input. And this is an input. And some of these inputs are uh, positive. They cause depolarization. And some of these inputs 
are going to cause hyperpolarization. And all these inputs come in. Oh, come on, guys. Uh, what's happening here is that the voltages are swinging up and down. And then finally, they're going to hit a threshold. Okay. And there's a point at which you get communication, synaptic communication. And that, as I'll show you, happens at something at about 0.5 millivolts. So again, the voltage to make the cell communicate with its neighbor is separated by a factor of, again, very close to 2 kT over E. And this, is, this gives you some separation. Let's um, let's look at this in a little more uh, let's look at this in a little more detail. All right, is everybody with me on this? Hello? Yes. Okay, you're all there. All right. So let me explain the threshold uh, property a little bit in care, in detail. Okay, so I want to actually start to explain a little bit what the notion is of this threshold process, which is going to serve two roles. And one role is uh, that we're going to learn about the action potential. So this has two, two roles. Is one, it's a, uh, it's a threshold detector. And it's, you know, if you had an AND gate, in digital logic, what you're doing is, if um, if the output is is zero one or one zero, the output from this thing is zero. It's only if the output is one one that this thing turns on. So, in a sense, there's a threshold at at a level of um, of like 1.5. So, a neuron has kind of the same flavor. You need inputs to come in and you need them to exceed a certain voltage. And that's their, so let's just look at the action potential a second. Now, phenomenologically, what you see is the following. You take a cell, like we've shown here, and I'm gonna put an electrode in the cell. I'm gonna inject current into the cell, which is I. And at the same time, because we're good experimentalists, we're gonna be measuring the voltage from this cell, V. So we're going to get a picture that looks something like this. This is time, and this is current. And I'm going to put a little current pulse in like this. And I'm going to be measuring the voltage of the cell. Now the cell usually, let's just, 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 just remember our little diagram from, from before. This is like plus 75. This is minus 90 which is everything is in millivolts, okay? Threshold was sitting at around minus 40. So the cell is sitting somewhere around here. This is called rest. So normally the cell is sitting right around here. Let's just call it minus 60 millivolts. I'm not gonna write millivolts because the pen is kind of funky. When I put this pulse in, if the pulse is small, the cell, of course, has capacitance across the membrane. It'll depolarize. And over here, it'll repolarize. And this is as boring as could be. On the other hand, if the current that I inject is bigger, then the cell will do something like this. Its potential will start to rise. And you'll see some event. And all of a sudden, the potential will jump very suddenly from one point to another point. This point is going to be somewhere between 0 and 10 millivolts. All right, the fact that it's positive or negative is not particularly important. But the point is it's jumping to a point here, which I'll just call top of action potential. Okay, and this is coming in at around plus 5 millivolts. And it'll stay there. It'll rise 
and it's going to rise in something like 10 to the minus 4 seconds. And then it's going to decay very slowly. And it's going to decay in something like 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So to we want to understand this event because this event is basically saying, aha, uh -huh, the, the logic of inputs coming in has exceeded a certain amount. Okay. So I'm just going to mention, without uh, going into detail, that this also leads to a pulse that propagates. So not only does the cell make a decision, but the same machinery that makes a decision of the cell allows the pulse actually to propagate down here, down the axon. All right. So now we have to understand uh, this process a little bit. All right. Now, Fred really uh, sort of gave you the key piece of machinery where what uh, Fred told you about was the idea of a voltage uh, gated or dependent inductance and a particular voltage gated channel. Actually, I'll just remind everybody that Fred was the first human being to actually measure the properties of a single channel. Okay, so let's erase this. All right, let me let me go to my magic eraser. Okay, we have to make him a, we have to make the eraser a little bigger. So what I want to do is I want to set up a brutalized version of a. Um, oh, I think I'm not doing this as smart as I could. Come back, come back. Oh, never mind. I want to set up a sort of brutalized model where the cell has two conductances. <clears throat> it has a potassium conductance, which in fact will not be voltage dependent, even though this is a growth simplification. And I'll have a sodium conductance that is voltage dependent. And this will allow me to set up a situation of bistability, which is the essential uh, signaling mechanism in the cell. All right. So, um, the conductances look like uh, look like this. Let me give me a second here. Well, never mind. Okay, the conductance is going to. Okay, um, I need to go back to my pen. I'm going to have a conductance due to potassium, which is boring. It's going to be a constant as a function of voltage. So here the conductance is zero, and there is some, some maximum value. And then I'm going to have a conductance as a, func as a function of voltage for sodium. And this is going to con start at zero, a very low voltage. And then at some point it's going to turn on, and it's going to stay on. Okay. Now, normally, the probability of um, this channel being uh, on over the probability of it being off is just equal to a Boltzmann factor, right? It's going to be some potential across the membrane uh, divided by uh, KBT, okay? So this, this tells you that this so therefore, the probability of this channel being on, or more properly of this gate uh, being open, is going to look something like uh, 1 over 1 plus e to the minus e, this is the voltage across the membrane, over KBT. Okay, so as voltage goes to infinity, this is 1. Now, this thing is, uh, this thing has a width which is on the order of uh, 25 millivolts, or if you work it out, it, it's maybe half that, so it's maybe on the order of 12 millivolts. But I'm going to ignore that, okay? So what that says is that this threshold voltage here is actually a little bit of a band. But for the moment, I'm going to ignore it. So I want to understand what happened to this thing. So I could write down, I can make a model of a cell. And the model of the cell is going to look like this. This is inside. And this is a conductance 
bit of potassium. And this is the inside. And the inside is at some voltage V. And then I'm going to put a battery here. Okay, and this is just the battery due to potassium. Okay, let me move this down a little bit. And then this is the outside. And then I'm going to put another conductance here, which is a conductance due to sodium. And I'm going to put another battery here. All right. And now I'm going to allow for the, pa the possibility of passing some current into the cell. Okay, we all remember a current is equal to the conductance due to potassium of V minus V potassium plus a conductance due to sodium. And this guy depends on voltage, as, so I'm just going to put a little line through it. So clearly, at steady state, or equilibrium, I is equal to zero, and therefore, the voltage here is just equal to VK plus. Okay, so let's draw a little picture of this. Okay, so let's, let's go down here and, oops, let's try it again. Okay, everybody's calm? Everybody's calm. Nope. Nobody's calm. Let's try it again. <laughs> Sorry, testing is very frustrating. Okay, so let's draw a picture here. And this is I, and this is V. So this is this equilibrium point. I'm going to label it VK plus. And what's going to happen is if I now inject a little bit of current into the cell, all right. I'm going to start to move on a line, and I and I'm going to get to this. I'm going to get to this point, right? My voltage is going to increase if I inject a little bit of positive current. If I inject a little bit of negative current, I'm going to move here. The minute the current goes back to zero, I snap back to this point. Okay. The question is this: Finally, I inject so much current, I'm at a point V, and um, let me just redraw this other picture over there. This is going to be the total conductance. So here the conductance is just VK plus. This is some threshold voltage, which is just this point over here. And when you finally get to the threshold voltage, I open up the sodium conductance. And now the total conductance goes to VK plus plus DNA plus. Not only that, but all of a sudden now, I see this battery. I see this sodium battery, okay? So if I inject enough current, in fact, to take me just past this point, it's kind of interesting now, because now, if the current is large enough, I've gone from here to the point where the sodium conductance is non-zero and the total conductance is higher. So I expect a new equilibrium condition. So now let's see what happens, okay? At this point now, um, DNA is not equal to zero, okay? And I can just write and I could just solve it for I equals zero. So now when I turn the current off, I'm not going to go back to this point, to my original uh, equilibrium point. It's going to be a new equilibrium point. And that's found by solving this equation. Zero equals VK plus. Okay, V minus VK plus plus DNA. V minus DNA. Or... V is equal to VK plus, VK plus, plus DNA plus DNA over the sum of the conductances. So there's a new equilibrium point, which is right here. 
which is just this. So let's call this, um, let's call this V action potential, right? And we just call this one V action potential. So now the conductance in this state is much higher, right? The conductance in this state is, is GK plus GNA multiplying the voltage, right? The conductance is just DI dV, right, which is just GK plus plus GNA plus, so that's going to be a greater slope, which is this line, okay? So what happens is if I depolarize the cell and I get to this, and I get to this line, I'm going to move along here and along here, and now I'm on this branch, and when the current goes to zero, I snap back to that part. And the importance of this is the following. Because what's happened now is I've made myself a little action potential. So let me just draw this. What I've done is I started here at VK plus, and I started to depolarize the cell, which is moving along this curve. And then all of a sudden I snap to this point, which I call V action potential. And now when I drop the current, I stay there. Okay, so in this very simple model, I would stay there forever. Now, I told you before, when we look at a real action potential, my little cartoon, I'll go back to it, the rise time is one-tenth the decay time. So this little model, heavily brutalized, just explains the basic bistability that gives you, oops, that gives you this rise. Okay, let me, let me get this little picture stable. So this is the rise of the action potential. And this takes place in roughly the 10 to the minus four second time scale. Okay, all of a sudden now, we have to put in a lot of details that have to do with how this thing decays away, with how synapses uh, integrate their inputs, et cetera, et cetera. But I want you to get the gist. We, we've really sort of covered the basics here as to this uh, issue of, uh, of integration. All right, any, any questions so far? All right, that's, I'll take that as, uh, as a, either everybody is lost or everybody is sleeping or uh, it was, this, despite the bad handwriting, this was reasonably clear. Okay, I, I really, I don't understand, but I really wanna answer all the questions. So email to bk at ucsd.edu. And I'm just gonna take out my little Blackberry and I'll, I'll just see all the emails as they come in. Uh, okay, we had the action potential. Now we have to understand this issue of isolation and transmission. So let's understand what happens. You have many inputs, but I'm just gonna draw two inputs just for simplicity. Okay, so these are called presynaptic. And now, come on, they'll glom on to a dendrite of a cell like this. Cell may have many other dendrites, but we're just looking at two of these. So let me get rid of this cell. These are the dendrites. This is the soma. And this is where the cell decides that it wants to make a pulse. All right, so remember from this energy diagram, I'll just scoot down, or I'll just draw it again. It's a, it's a, it's a very useful, we basically had a threshold here. A 
think what we want to do is we want to make sure we I basically said that the thresholds are soft, okay? And then we want we have another threshold I'm going to describe in a second, which has to do for um, for generating transmission. But there's a split. Okay, the split's important. The split is important because you don't want an you don't want an event to accidentally cause you now, so this cell now will communicate with its neighbor. And this uh, neighboring cell will then have an output. So a pulse goes down. And one on this distance, what, what's the material? And let me actually explain to you what, uh, let me give you, I need to actually get a picture now um, from my laptop. And, uh, oops. Okay, so here we go. I want to show you this picture. In order for the cell to communicate with its neighbor, uh, nature built a special set of machinery called the synapse. And the synapse has, the synapse gets its, its unidirectional effect, its kind of diode effect. Because what it does is it takes an electrical pulse and it turns that electrical pulse into an influx of ions. Okay, and then it takes that influx of ions and causes it to release a molecule on one side. So basically what's happening is an electrical pulse comes in, but molecules are only coming off on this side. Now the machinery of this is, is very impressive. And, and I'm not doing, this is a lecture in itself without doing any kind of justice. But the thing is molecules have come off on this side and they bind, and these molecules bind on the postsynaptic side. So the current that flows on the postsynaptic side Well, something like the activity on the presynaptic side, like a spike, like an action potential, okay, times some synaptic conductance, and then it's again, it's a voltage minus a uh, synaptic voltage. So Fred spoke about acetylcholine receptors, and Fred spoke about glutamate receptors, and that's basically mapped into this term, okay? But the point is that signals can only go in this direction. Now we're gonna focus on one part, okay? Which is the conversion of an electrical pulse into ions, okay? And what we wanna look at this conversion because we have to be able to turn on this conversion process. So this conversion process uses a particular channel, okay? This particular channel it's called the n-type calcium channel. It's, it's a funky name for one of nature's very important inventions because this channel does not conduct. So what's, what's shown here is the voltage, okay? Let's look at, um, let's look at this, and then um, let me just make this a little bit bigger, okay? Look at the voltage scale. This channel doesn't start to turn on until minus 30 millivolts. So basically, this conversion of electrical pulses to ions cannot occur within this entire integration process, okay? Finally, when the, the voltage in the cell gets to about zero to plus five millivolts, this current 
so the current is, is, is so negative because it's, it's, it's a current uh, that's leaving the cell, okay? Sorry, the current coming into the cell, okay, is peaked right here. If the action potential was too high, if the action potential went as high as the sodium reversal potential, which is coming in right around minus 75 millivolts, this current would be zero, okay? What the action potential wants to do is it wants to take the cells, the height of this current, and this current will supply ions then, okay? So basically this conversion is maximum at around five millivolts. So the action, so the cell is integrating in here. When it crosses threshold, a pulse takes you up to this uh, voltage level, which turns on this n-type channel. And this basically starts synaptic release. Okay, the consequence is now that this pulse can now activate a downstream neuron and you start, you could see that you get a pulse, it could cause this cell to get some positive current. If enough positive current comes in, this cell fires a pulse, activates the neuron downstream, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of a, it's just, uh, I think an hour has gone by. It's giving you a little bit of a flavor of um, how the single cell works. Okay, so tell me, do I have a few more minutes or should I stop? I want to look at this issue here. I want to look at the basis of synaptic transmission. So I think what I mentioned earlier was that the cell uh, has a rather narrow, has a range of about uh, 20 millivolts. Let's go back to this picture. Nope. Okay. Let's just go back to this picture. Typically, the cell sits at around minus 60, and threshold is around minus 40. So there's a window, which is around KT. It's around 20 millivolts. Okay, and this is where synapses have an effect. Now, I showed you this picture at the beginning from Bobby uh, Kasuri, and there are thousands of the inputs that are coming into the cell. Because if there are millivolts and there's a thousand of them, that's a volt. I mean, that'll kill the cell. So let's just take a look. Let's just take a look here. Okay. Okay. You see this picture? Okay. Okay. Do you see this uh, this picture by Valverde? Okay, we'll just, I'm just going to leave this because in, in, the, in the interest of time. Um, let me just, this is a, a, I just want to give you a little bit of a compendium of data about what's going on in terms of sizes. So you can make a set of measurements, um, and this is from a review by Mika Slavsky, where you can actually stick an electrode in one cell, like I mentioned, and inject some current, cause it to fire, and then you could look and see, so that's like cell one fired an action potential. And then you can look in cell three, which is shown in red. And you see that you get a depolarization, which is on the order of about 500 uh, microvolts or about a half a millivolt. Now, it turns out that's sort of a typical number. So if you need about 20 millivolts to fire a cell, you're getting on average about half a millivolt. So you need to get on the order of 50-ish inputs, and that's actually maybe 10% of the total inputs of the cell to be active at the same time. But um, let me just give you another uh, bit of flavor here about the nature of the inputs. So what's, what's come out um, and is that if um, you look at um, – cells that had made a connection from one cell to the other, which is like shown in the middle here, where it says uh, 495. In fact, some significant fraction of cells, more than chance, actually make bi-directional connections, okay? But the more interesting thing 
is, like I said, this is about a half a millivolt uh, input. But what's interesting is that there's always a fraction of connections that are very large. These are between two and three millivolts. What that means is that you only need something like five or at most 10 inputs from neighbors. And I just, there's sort of an important point here. And there are many people have actually made these measurements and these are four uh, such examples, okay? And um, the, the point is that each of these, they measured from different parts of cortex, they uh, measured in different ways, and they all get these sort of very large uh, numbers. In some cases, uh, even five millivolts, it means like you need two inputs that come in. So despite the fact that there's a huge number of inputs, you end up with a picture that looks like this. And I'm, I'm gonna stop here. So this is uh, data that comes from uh, Thomas uh, Mercek Vogel's laboratory. I mean, it, it literally was just uh, published six months ago, but um, it just tells you that even though the neurons may have thousands of inputs, in fact, only a small fraction, something like 5% are particularly strong. And those 5% could actually drive the cells to fire. And on top of that, they have these very many thousands of very weak inputs. So it's, it's these inputs that are being integrated and that cause the cell to cross thresholds and uh, fire an action potential. And I think I'll, um, I'll just stop there. Okay, so th thanks a lot. Uh, anybody who has questions, why don't you just email them to me?